There's a church in San Francisco. It stands on the corner of Turk and Lion. This is no ordinary church. On the first Sunday of every month, they turn off all the lights and listen in reverence to the horn of their patron saint, John Coltrane. The one and only John Coltrane, the saxophonist, who took giant steps among the ranks of Thelonious Monk and Miles Davis. John Coltrane, the innovator, who rewrote the book on jazz improvisation as we know it, and whose impact on the music can't be summed up into any short description, or perhaps even in the written word. John Coltrane, the prophet, whose legacy-defining album Love Supreme inspired millions of spiritual experiences and is considered by some musicians too sacred to perform. But here in this church, they do. To this church, Coltrane was the Alpha and the Omega, the Holy Ghost incarnate, and his album of Love Supreme, their holy text. The devoted poured over every liner note, every song title, to unlock the divine secrets within. So how do you get here? To a church built on an album? Well, you don't just play the highlights from a Love Supreme. You start at the beginning and listen all the way through. It all started with a love story. San Francisco, 1960s. A couple beamed with the glow of young love. We were high school sweethearts, you know. Franzo, son of a Pentecostal minister, seemingly destined for a holy path. He turned to me and he said, you know I'm going to preach. Do you think you can be a preacher's wife? And I said, yes. <laughs> Marina, descended from religious figures, activists, musicians. Like any good religious origin story, their union seemed divinely orchestrated, inevitable. Our hearts was locked together, man. It was something that happened in heaven. They married, and one year later, Franzo and Marina King celebrated their wedding anniversary by hitting the jazz clubs. For years, San Francisco had a thriving jazz scene rooted in the Fillmore District, known then as the Harlem of the West. Let's, let's paint the town. Let's start with Trey. Franzo and Marina went across town to a club called the Jazz Workshop. They were turned away at first, but on that night, Franzo knew the doorman. So he took us in, put us right up front. John Coltrane walked out on the stage and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit walked out with him. And when he pointed his horn, his saxophone, the soprano. I really felt like he was pointing it at us. I saw Sonny Rollins and Roland Kirk, but it was something different about John Coltrane. And it's as though he knew who we were and what we were there for, even though we didn't at the time. There was some communication that took place. It was like John Coltrane was a Pentecostal preacher because he was definitely speaking in another language. And there they sat, transfixed by an experience they could only define later as their sound baptism. It was the beginning of the rest of their lives. The Holy Ghost fell in a jazz club in 1965, and our lives were changed forever. 1955, Coltrane was a rising star. He was playing in Miles Davis' first great quintet, but he was also in the throes of a heroin addiction. You know, God was always with him. Yeah, he slipped off the path for a while. His habit got worse until finally Davis fired him backstage. This was a wake-up call. Coltrane quit cold turkey. He locked himself in a room and experienced, in his own words, a spiritual awakening. 
And then he humbly asked to be given the means and the privilege to make others happy through music. Most of his music, particularly everything that is 1957 and beyond when he had a spiritual awakening, that is all divinely inspired. That's Pastor Juanica, by the way, Franzo and Marina's daughter. Coltrane rejoined Davis in 1958 and worked to define his distinct style known as the Sheets of Sound. He was bouncing back higher than ever. So in 1964, Coltrane set out to make a record unlike anything he'd done before. He wanted to write an album as an offering to God. Since isolation inspired his spiritual awakening before, he sat alone in his attic again. After inscribing the final notes, he returned to his wife, Alice. John Coltrane came down the stairs in their home and he had an aura about him. And she said he looked like Moses coming down from the mountaintop, right? And uh, he looked at her and said, for the first time, I've received it all at once. In many ways, this album was unlike anything else Coltrane ever made. He created or chose every detail, the artwork, the liner notes, the prayer that he wrote and released alongside it. It's the only album he made featuring his own voice and his own writing. Some jazz musicians won't even play these songs. They're considered too personal to Coltrane. In fact, there's only one live recording of Coltrane performing the entire suite. It is arguably his most intentional and sacred work. And in a stroke of luck, fate, or divine timing, this album happened to come out the very year that Marina and Franzo had their sound baptism. And so they turned to it for guidance. And at that time, I wasn't really uh, about church, uh, but I've always been about God. Marina and Franzo responded to the call of the sound baptism by bringing Coltrane's music to listening clinics at their apartment. Not just listening to it, but really getting into the music. What is to come from this? How do we guide and direct our lives from here? Meanwhile, the Harlem of the West was steadily being dismantled around them. Redevelopment pushed Black-owned jazz clubs out of the neighborhood. We got to try to make a contribution here to bring this music back to the community. There was so much unrest in the world. You know, there was so much racial inequities and, and police brutality. The music brought a, a certain comfort to us. They began searching in earnest for ways to use their gatherings to bring healing and enlightenment to the black community. It wasn't just about saving, quote, jazz, but it was about saving a people. They called themselves the One Mind Temple. They incorporated prayer, meditation, and fasting. Every first Wednesday, we had to fast for three days. You know, it was about controlling the flesh. And we had tongue inspectors at the door. Because once you fast for three days, you get a little white film on your tongue. And if you couldn't pass the tongue <laughs> inspection, <laughs> you couldn't come to the service and they continue to study the music of a love supreme. Well, there's formula in the love supreme because uh, he talks about acknowledgments, resolutions, pursuance. The titles of the album's four songs reveal the path to enlightenment, acknowledge your sins, resolve to amend them, pursue that path, and song, the final prayer, give thanks to God. They believed John Coltrane's music was a link to the highest order, that he was an incarnation of God. And you see John Coltrane saying that he wants to play music that 
help people to live happy and productive lives. That's in the likeness of what Jesus was really about, making life better for folks. They ate vegetarian as Coltrane did. They taught yoga and started a community meal service. Feeding the hungry to be right with God is to be right with the people. We wanted to look out for the people as a whole. They were affirmed in their devotion. By this point, Marina and Franzo's lives were dedicated to this movement. John Coltrane died of complications due to liver cancer in 1967. Though he had quit 10 years prior, heroin still left his mark. I think John, Charlie Parker, Billy Holiday had succumbed to the uh, premeditated and calculated thought and idea of bringing heroin to Harlem. I mean, the black community was targeted for that. So when I heard that John had died, my thing was they killed John. The primary source for not only their philosophy, but also their joy, was gone. But he left behind more than his music. His wife and their children. But to define Alice Coltrane simply as John's widow would be ridiculous. Alice was a jazz icon in her own right. And to the church, she was the wife of God. So they sought her out. She was playing over in Berkeley, California. We were so excited when we heard about it. And at that time, we referred to her as the mother, mother of the, the royal, royal family. family you know. We uh, prepared to go and see her, and we managed to get behind the stage. And I remember we almost kind of like forced our way into the place. Back to her dressing room. We put up Love Supreme and flowers and incense. She was walking out of the hall with some other people. There they stood in this sacred moment before the wife of God. Alice Coltrane told us, you, you are, fulfilling are fulfilling John's father's. She referred to him as the father's highest, highest ideals. ideals. Whoa. It was so beautiful hearing her say that. This was a total affirmation of their faith from the person closest to John, both personally and spiritually. And it defined the church for a while, or what the church was about to become. And she said that the Lord had a uh, initiation for me. I got one for Mother Hawk too. That's what Mother Marina was Mother Hawk at that time. Yeah, for, for the whole community. So it kind of went like that. Together, she and the Kings co-founded a brand new organization called the Vedantic Center. It was all Hindu names. Now we're dressing in white. I shaved my head. And Alice revealed connection to John through Hindu texts. One in particular involved the avatar Krishna. Blue, black, beautiful, mind enchanting lord, player, player of, of the, the flute. flute. Oh my God, blue train is Krishna. <laughs> so now John Coltrane becomes Lord Krishna now. That's who John was to us. He was an avatar. We viewed him as, as God. And Alice, who led the congregation in Hindu chants, meditations, and teachings from the Bhagavad Gita, was their direct link to John. Oh, we were blissed out. We was having a natural ball, man. If the story stopped here, it would read as a testament to devotion, love, finding heaven on earth. But it doesn't. Very early on, we could see that there was going to be some really strong differences. Rather than include new beliefs alongside their old ones, Franzo and Marina were instead told over time to favor Alice's philosophies as John's words fell by the wayside. Put your old-time religious ways 
in the treasure chest, along with your horns. She wanted to just cloister us, basically, and, and meditate all the time. We really felt that um, we needed to be working amongst the people. They split off and devoted themselves fully back to Coltrane. John, that is. Alice sued them. Yes, she did. She sued the church for $7.5 million. And um, we were distressed to hear that, you know. We didn't see it going there, but it did. The suit stated that Alice's personal religious beliefs are antithetical to the purported beliefs of the One Mind Church. She claimed that when she first met the Kings, she urged them to stop using John's name for commercial reasons, and that she helped financially support the church for a few years so they would. But suddenly, Alice dropped the lawsuit. The Kings never knew why. I always said it like this, we had our blessings, and now we have a reprimand, and we are pleased and glad to God for it. Whatever she did in terms of the lawsuit, it didn't diminish our love and our respect for her and our appreciation for what she brought. One of the early, the mission statements was to spread the globe of Coltrane consciousness over the world. And we felt that's what that lawsuit did. It, it brought the church to the attention of the public on a larger scale. The scandal also drew the attention of an archbishop from the African Orthodox Church. So he comes and he talks to us. He says, oh, clearly there's not $7.5 million here in this building. This archbishop saw in the Kings an opportunity to extend his network to the West Coast. But the Kings had stipulations this time. John Coltrane's name will have to be as high as any other name, if not higher, before we can come into this church. Well, he said... In the African Orthodox Church. He cannot be an avatar. John Coltrane cannot be God, okay? He can be your patron saint. And then we knew that there was an interview that John Coltrane did in Japan, and they asked him, what is he going to be 10 years from now? He said, I'd like to be a saint. Ah, okay, we'll accept. <laughs> so that's when we say we demoted John from God to our patron saint. One of my favorite quotes from John Coltrane is when he says, um, I'd like to point out to people the divine in a musical language that transcends words. I want to speak to their souls. Christians and Muslims and Hindus and atheists and agnostics all in the same place. We came here just like, just strangers kind of trying to pull up and see the experience. We got so much love, like from like. Literally, as soon as we pulled up, like, like come to love, the front. It was, it was like it was right. like, literally like family. family. It was literally like family. The church has gone by many names, but it still stands. The same cannot be said of the Fillmore. The Harlem of the West is gone. There's no Bob City, there's no Blue Mirror, Jackson Sutter Street, yeah, they're gone. And as one of the last remaining institutions from the Fillmore Jazz era, the Kings are holding on to something still, after 50 years, that the world tried to take away from them. There's always something new that you get from it. It's, it's a, a living entity, <laughs> always evolving. It was the same thing with this community, and I think maybe 
that I think that has a lot to do with the longevity of this community. There's still a church in San Francisco. It stands on the corner of Turk and Lion, and its patron saint is, and will be, John Coltrane. Love the free, I love the free, I love the free.